Khaled, by the way, disagrees with me that this was the best year ever, but uh, he will tell you why. Khaled and I worked together back in 1992, uh, Santa Barbara, beautiful company, ACC, that we eventually sold to uh, Ericsson in 1998. Uh, it was a good exit, 285 million, four times higher than the price we thought the company was actually worth. <laughs> And then he became a serial entrepreneur and then a venture capitalist in the last seven to 10 years. So with that in mind, Khaled will then share with you his perspective and with the entrepreneurs about what you should do to get funding from him. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thank you Osama and thanks everybody for having me this evening. Um, so as Osama said, I was gonna talk about how to approach VCs in general and not a specific VC here. And uh, maybe just talk a little bit about how, what process we go through and therefore what an entrepreneur should be prepared for when they come and meet with people like myself and other VCs around the area, what they should be prepared for because of what we're gonna be looking for and what we're gonna be asking. So this is gonna make it look very scientific how we proceed and how we make our investments so that we can maximize our returns. But Osama talking about work, they reminded me of a recent story we had which shows the exact opposite. A while ago, maybe eight, nine years ago, we invested in a company, small technology company in Ireland of all places. And the company went nowhere. It was totally unsuccessful. And in the end, we gave up and uh, decided to shut it down, basically close it. And so were the founders. And we got this exp uh, expression of interest from a company saying, we'll buy them, you know, not a lot of money. And we said, sure, you know, we'll, we'll sell it to you. And we want cash. And they said, no, no, we don't want to give you cash. We're another startup and we don't have a lot of cash, but we'll give you some shares. And so reluctantly we accepted. We wrote the investment down to zero and we parked the shares somewhere. And today that investment is a 10x investment sitting on our portfolio because the company that acquired us and who we wanted cash from and insisted on giving us shares was Workday. And so they went, we didn't even know who they were at the time. They went from nothing to seven, eight billion dollars of market cap right now in a very, very fast time frame. So it's always better to be lucky than to be good. <laughs> but having said this, whoops, here we go. What I'd like to talk about is sort of the everyday work we put into it. And again, how to, do we evaluate opportunities as VCs? And I'm with a firm called Interwest Partners, by the way. Uh, and therefore, again, f as an entrepreneur, from the entrepreneur's perspective, what they should be prepared for and how to think about the opportunity that they're going to go be pr pursuing. So the theme of the talk is what do VCs look for when evaluating an opportunity? Uh, there, is, there are lots of sources of capital. The focus here is on what we do and what I can talk about, which is early stage, technology-centric startups raising capital. There are angel investors who are willing to fund companies. There are corporate investors willing to fund companies. I'm gonna focus, just to narrow this so that we can do it in about a half hour, on VCs funding technology-focused uh, early stage companies. And I'm happy to take questions either during or after, especially from our guests. So anybody, if you have a question while we're going through this, I'd be happy to try and answer it then, or I'll be around later again if somebody wants to talk. Whoops, that was too fast. The other thing I'll say, it's always very tough to follow Osama in these presentations because my presentation compared to his from, an, from a graphics and how well done it is, is always embarrassing. So this is the only graphic you're going to see in my presentation. <laughs> Every else is dense words and bullets. Exactly what we tell people not to do, but that's what I've done. So how, at a very high level, one way to think about how VCs evaluate opportunities is as a series of screens or filters or 
barriers that the opportunity, and we see lots of them every day, and the numbers keep increasing now that the whole economy is on a rebound, and the technology sector is on a rebound. And these filters, most of the time, the c very few of these opportunities will be able to penetrate all the way through and become an investment. And we group how we think about these companies and these categories of filters in these categories that you see here. Is there an unmet need? Is it a big market? Is, it, is the technology or product differentiated? Is there a scalable business model here? Is this the right time? And I'd like to talk about that because most of the mistakes are made on that. And is this the right team, of course? So you could boil this down to just big market, good team, but actually the process is a little bit more convoluted, a little bit more uh, sophisticated than that. So I'm going to go through each one of these and give examples of what we mean by it, how we assess it. Can, and it's not always, by the way, that we can prove for sure that and get over every one of these things, but you just want to get a sense that there is a plausible story that this company or this idea or this team is going to be able to answer most of these questions and make you comfortable about the bulk of what they're doing. So first thing, again, is there an unmet need? What does that mean? Uh, is there a demand for this product in the market or will there be a demand at the right time and, uh, once the product is ready? And so what we look for when somebody comes in and says, I think this is the greatest idea, is, well, how do you know that? Okay. Is there market research on this specific area? Is it market research you've conducted and what is it? Or is it market, the derivative market research which is uh, stuff that others have conducted and that you are trying to, to figure out? Or is this more a personal gut feeling? Is it insight that you've been doing a job or you've been doing something for a long period of time and you've developed an expertise in this area and you see the problem in your own life, professional or personal life, and that's why you think or you can make a case that there's an unmet need. And then there are two sets of categories when you think about these unmet needs. Is it a known old problem that couldn't be resolved before? That's a pretty large category of problems out there where there is a big demand, but it just not, nothing could be done about it in the past. And the perfect examples of these are a whole bunch of companies that have been enabled by sort of the mass adoption of wireless and mobile technology. Example, we all like to talk about this company, Uber. The ability to call a limo or a cab anywhere by just pushing one <coughs> button on your cell phone and then be able to monitor the cab. The job gets assigned wirelessly, people pick it, bid on it, etc., and then you can monitor the cab coming to you on your cell phone in real time. You know, cabs have been around a long time. People have been hailing cabs and calling dispatchers and so on. But this beauty of this, uh, of this solution that what these guys do, uh, and others like them do, has only become possible in the last few years uh, because of new technology. So known all problems that simply couldn't be solved before. And finally, there are new problems, and this is the largest category of opportunities that we see, and that we like to try and get a sense for how big is the opportunity. New problems created by very large trends that are irreversible. Things that are tied, for example, to an aging population. Anything to do with drugs, healthcare, um, uh, related issues where as people get older, and we have a big bulge of aging uh, people in the United States and across the world, these are going to become bigger problems that, we, that will need solutions. Other things like distributed workforces. There were a certain set of problems in networking and computing, etc when companies, employees all came to the same factory or to the same building every day, well now they don't do that anymore. They work out of home, they're traveling, they're satellite offices and so on. They're mobile, they're a lot more mobile, and therefore a whole new set of problems emerge that, don't, that are looking for solutions. So first category again, is there an unmet need? And by the way, I don't mean that you go by these in that order, but these are all, again, questions that need to be answered satisfactorily, and therefore the entrepreneurs need to be prepared for them before we can get comfortable with moving, proceeding with an opportunity. Is it a big market? That's the other key thing. As I said before, we can boil all of this down to big market, good team, but big market is an important thing. And uh, going after smaller markets is very difficult and doesn't fit into the venture model. So you need to be convinced either that there is a big market today, which is what the first bullet says, 
something where you can point to existing incumbents who are large, existing markets and uh, people buying it, you know, where there is statistics because this is something that is already there and maybe your technology is going to disrupt it, disrupt it and allow you to gain a large market share. Or the other alternative, which happens quite a bit, is no, today it's not a big market, but it is riding a huge wave and therefore you can make a compelling case and a convincing case that over time this is going to be a big market. And here, you can't point to data per se. There isn't an established market that you can point to. So you need more of a thesis. So there has to be a story with some empirical evidence supporting it that people will buy into and therefore get excited about, yes, although this is not there today, it will be there by the time you have a product or in the next five years or whatever it is. Next area, move now from sort of market and unmet need to the technology or the product itself. This is, of course, where we spend a lot of time because this we can actually do work on. Is the technology, are you sufficiently different and better than what's out there today? Okay? And more importantly, is it enough, and this is really a key which we run into this situation with a lot of people who are a little bit better but not better enough to cause a customer to switch. And let me give you an example. I don't know if there are people here from Google, but a while ago I was talking to a young team uh, of engineers who were designing a new chip, processor chip, which they were saying could be faster than the Intel processor and totally compliant with the Intel processor. But they needed to, well, so, and, they, and that was their value propositions. They had the benchmarks to show it and so on. We started to talk to large customers and potential customers. And what we found out is because of other costs, cost of training, cost of infrastructure that existed, cost of knowledge that was already institutionalized within the organization, even a Forex, and this is what we were told by Google, for example, even a four times better price performance processor would not make it through the front door. You had to be in the 10x kind of range because of the work that they'd had to do to recompile their software onto this new platform. So, you know, intuitively you think, you know, if I can save you 50%, you should jump at it. But there are other costs in these migration and shifting costs that are equally important to the raw cost of the product that you're buying. And so, for, to cause somebody to shift from an established vendor to a young vendor, when I have to make changes in my personnel, and maybe the way I write my software, maybe the way I compile my software, et cetera, the bar was a lot higher. And this is an area where we spend a lot of time trying to understand, is it not just a little bit better, but better enough to be able to cause a customer to switch? <coughs> then there is, well, where do you get this differentiation? and uh, trying to understand, is it the people? Is it uh, 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 something that's changed structurally in the market or in the technology, something that wasn't available uh, before that's available now? And is that what's giving you this advantage? Then you turn this around and say, well, how are you going to convince customers? Can this differentiation be easily explained? And is it enough, again, like we said, to compel a customer to change? And finally, what's the competition like? And this, again, is an area some entrepreneurs pay a lot of attention to and others don't. They're so certain of how good what they're doing is that they don't spend the time or take the time, and we have to do this, to look at the broader environment and see, are there other companies doing something similar? How many are there? Usually, most entrepreneurs are aware of the established companies because they're published, they have a presence, people know about them, analysts write about them, etc. But typically, Things happen in waves, and there's a lot of other private companies, smaller companies, maybe companies that are not in the public eye yet, that may be competing with you and may have a better approach or a similar approach, and so on and so forth. So an area where, again, as part of the validation, again, as an entrepreneur, the more of these questions you have answered when you come in to talk to a VC, obviously, the better off you are. Whoops. Scalable business model, again. So this is now thinking, okay, the technology works, there is an unmet need, there is a large market, but what is the business gonna look like? Is there a business here that makes sense? Is it gonna scale over time? Who's the customer? How are you gonna sell it? What are the channels to market? How much are they gonna pay for this? And again, none of this is provable to the last three decimal points. It's just a sense of, does it make sense? Does it logically fit together? 
what is the cost going to be to deliver the product and service? And really important, especially for more hardware-oriented products, so less so with software, obviously, is what are the margins over time? Because a lot of products will sell and you will be able to build a business, but if you're not making enough money to justify the investment, to justify the research, the customer support and so on, it will never flip to the right side. It will always be burning cash or too, too much cash and therefore investors and the team will get tired over time. And last question tied to this and uh, logically tied to this, well, how much capital is it gonna take? I mean, you can do a lot with infinite capital, but infinite capital is not typically available. So how much is it gonna cost to build this business that's gonna have these characteristics over a certain period of time and, uh, and versus the risk that's involved? So the last two are timing and team again. Is this the right time? And this is something very intuitive, not intuitively obvious, but again, where a lot of companies fail. And I truly believe, and I've seen it myself in my operating experience and investment experience, Many startups, if not most, fail by being too early to a market rather than being too late, okay? This happens, or by being wrong. I mean, usually somebody from within a field is smart enough to know the general trends and where they're going. But most of the time, the failures happen because you're too early. And when you're too early, there is nothing you can do about it. You can't force a market or a population or a whole industry to come your way. You have to wait it out. And you have to wait it out. It's burning money, it's costing money, et cetera and then your technology becomes obsolete, or not, maybe not obsolete, but not the newest thing, and somebody else comes in and grabs the market. And this is probably the toughest thing to figure out when you're talking about an emerging market because there is no data to point to. And in the end, it's just a level of confidence that you build that, yeah, I'm willing to throw the dice with these entrepreneurs that this is going to be the right time. But this is, to me, if I, if I had to characterize the amount of time we spend on, it's probably here which is the toughest thing we talk to the most people, try and get a sense of is this really gonna happen or not. And generally you want to be, to be successful, you want to be in front of a major wave that's happening, but obviously not too far in front, that means you're too early to the market. And you also don't wanna be behind it because then there'll be too many companies competing and you'll have too tough competition. And obviously just even from the way I'm talking about it, it's hard to balance this. But this balance is what really maximizes the chance of success for a company. And finally, last but by no means least, is this the right team? And here it is a whole combination of things that we look for and that the team communicates to us when we are spending time with them in, in diligence. First of all, there is the obvious stuff, background, experience, and domain expertise. If you're gonna come in and say, I wanna do this because I know that IT departments and large carriers or large enterprises or whatever need it, you better have worked in that area or have some knowledge of this from before. So you and the original team needs to show and be convincing in that their background, their experience, and their domain expertise is the right one to be starting this company and that they have this vision that they've developed from that experience. Uh, motivation and cohesion. Why are you doing this? I interviewed somebody yesterday, amazing person from a large company here, who couldn't answer why, obviously I'm involved in startups and I only interview people that are coming into these startups. And this was for a VP operations and a manufacturing company. And there was no real reason that he could for, uh, formulate or tell me why he wanted to join a startup after he had never done a startup before. So it's not for everybody. Going, the risk, the work ethic, the amount of time required, the effort that's needed in a startup is not for everybody. With the founding team, obviously, that's something you wanna be comfortable with, that people are doing this for the right reasons, they're cohesive in why they're doing it, why they think this is important doing, uh, to do, and that they have some chemistry together uh, and have come together for that reason. Equally important is, can this team then attract other A players? One of the big cliches of venture is A players attract A players, B players attract C players, right? That's how it's put usually. And so as you build the company, the founding team is critical, obviously. But the next year of employees and the one after that, the people you're gonna bring in on the technical side, on the sales side, et cetera, for the company to succeed, you better be able to attract really powerful A players. And so, the founding team that is not viewed by the potential hires as an A team will not be able to do that. 
and that will probably kill more companies than anything else. Obviously, more mushy, and that's where you spend time, you go to dinner, and sometimes you meet with the person and their spouses, and so on and so forth. It's just to get a sense of who they are as individuals. You know, where, what's motivating them, uh, work eth uh, sorry, personal ethic, the kind of people they are, etc. And finally, in most startups, there is a core team, but there's a whole bunch of people around them, lawyers, advisors, maybe some PhD thesis advisor from the school, if, it's a, if, if that's where the team is coming from, etc. Who are these people, and how much are they going to contribute? So it sounds like a very you know, long list of things. Like I said at the beginning, we don't try to be 100% answer each one of these, but those are the type of questions that we're going to be going through our mind in every meeting, in every encounter, when we're calling customers and references, etc., potential customers and references. And again, my advice to entrepreneurs is typically the more of these questions you come in prepared to answer, the easier it's going to be. So that's why I thought it would be useful to list these here. I want to introduce one other concept, which is always a big question for entrepreneurs, which is how much money should you raise? Is it always the more money, the better? Or how do you think about how much money to raise initially? Again, as I said at the beginning of this presentation, I'm focusing on early stage companies. And so a concept that I found very useful and that entrepreneurs that we talk to, we try and introduce them to this as they're thinking about the size of the round that they want, is this thing, we call, I call it whatever, next significant value inflection point. And it's not that we should raise $5 million because the other company raised $5 million, or I should raise $10 million because you know, I think I can get it, etc. The concept of this next significant inflection point is one that the logic goes as follows. Most of the companies we fund end up raising more money, a Series B, a Series C, sometimes more. But this is not typically a single first investment is not the only investment that this company is going to raise. Then, so the thinking is, well, OK, you want you and your investors will want this round, you know, when you go to raise the next round, that there is going to be, it's going to be an attractive round. And you're going to be able to raise this next money, not the one we're talking about now, but the next one, at an attractive valuation for everybody around, so an up round. So the question becomes not what is the number by some miracle, but what do you think you have to accomplish on this initial money in order to be able to raise the next round at an attractive valuation. So what do you have to accomplish to get that up round? And these accomplishments, you know, you don't need a list of 200 of them, but two or three key things that the investors that are going to look at this company in a year or in 18 months or in two years to invest the next round of capital are going to like and be impressed with. And then last, you boil it back down to, well, okay, in order to accomplish these milestones, how much time and how much money do, are we going to need to get there? And of course, if you're smart, you add some buffer because you don't want to be cutting it too short. The concept or the principle underlying this is that you should, it doesn't always follow that the less money is better. Capital efficiency is great. Everybody benefits if a company executes well and doesn't burn a lot of cash. But being undercapitalized going into a venture is not the smartest thing. You may be doing everything right. You just don't have enough runway or enough money to get to that next significant milestone. So I'm nearly done. I'll just give you a couple of examples of how to think about this NSVIP or next significant uh, value inflection point in different types of environments. And I specifically didn't put numbers because they're all over the place. And this is a discussion that we like to have with the entrepreneurs so that jointly we agree on what is the right financing for the company and we all agree on what the milestones that are going to be accomplished on this money are. So take, for example, and these are different depending on sector and industry and so on, but for something like a consumer photo app, I picked that totally out of thin air and a freemium model, okay? What would be sort of these significant value inflection points? You know, at the high level, you could say you have to complete, on this money, you're going to want to complete and launch a minimum viable product, release 1.0 of this product. You're going to want to acquire a certain number of users. I said it's a freemium model, so some of these users, these users initially will not be paying customers, but they're going to be there. So acquire a certain number of customers. And then on these first 100,000, 200, I don't know, I put XXX because I'm not sure what the right number is. I have an idea, of course, but whatever that number is, then you need to show 
compelling metrics on how these users, although they're not paying for the product, if they're paying, it would be a different set of criteria, but if they're not paying, then how engaged are they with this application? Are they using it every day, every month, every week? Are they using it multiple times a day? How many people downloaded it but never registered? How many downloaded it and registered but never used it, etc. So pull together sufficient statistics that you can actually show to the next person who's going to come and invest or next firm that this is an application that people are resonating with, they are using it seriously, and they are enjoying the use. This could be one example of sort of what this uh, next significant value inflection point could be. Completely different than something targeted at enterprises, right? I mean, if you are building a SaaS software as service application targeted at SMBs, typically, you, what you, having the product is obviously important, but nobody doubts that ultimately a product that does some function that a business wants in software can be done. I mean, usually you get some people and they can do it. The question is, complete the product, but to demonstrate two other things. Will people pay for it? Will customers that are enterprise customers, not consumers, actually take it in, use it, and say, yes, we're willing to pay money for it? So which validates the core value proposition. Another set of criteria might be, before we raise the next round, we need to have a more complete management team. So use, again, figure out how long is it going to do to finish the product, get a couple, a dozen or so customers that are paying customers to validate the technology and the core value proposition, and finally, hire some key managers. So these are two examples, and again, there could be a lot more, and again, this is an iterative process with the entrepreneurs, but the concept here is, once you agree on what these milestones are between the investor and the team, then that will tell you how much money, again, with a buffer, should be raised at this point. There is nothing, nothing magical about all Series A's should be $2 million or $10 million, or I only want to give this much of the company. This is the way that we like to think about it, and I would advise a lot of entrepreneurs to think about it that way. Question? Yes. Is there a, is there a typical amount of buffer that a VC would accept? Uh, I mean, again, it is a discussion, so there isn't a magical number, but typically, I mean, a buffer, if, if say you're funding, if this turns out to be roughly a one-year project, you know, based on the milestones, a three-month buffer is pretty normal. Three to six months might be sort of a reasonable number. If it's a six-month project, obviously the buffer can't be another, I mean, it could be, but then you're going to show sort of, you're not really convinced you can do it in that time. So buffers typically are three months, three to six months on any project of any size. But again, I don't want to give a number like that because the whole point is it is a discussion. It depends on what the milestones are. It depends how much time you think it's going to take without the buffer and then the buffer is added. I think that was my last slide. So are there any other questions or uh, comments? Gentlemen? Uh, just a question about the, we talk about the money we want to raise, but we don't talk about the portion of capital that uh, you take. Uh, the valuation, the OK. So I had slides on that, but uh, we, we didn't cover those today. The valuation, I mean, that is a obviously a very difficult area to give an answer to. So what goes into assessing what the valuation should be? It's a number of things. And some favor the entrepreneurs, and some and it really is changes in time. I mean, in the United States today, or a year ago, on the consumer side, there was so much money pursuing opportunities that the power and the pendulum swing was in favor of the entrepreneurs. And so you saw some things being done at valuations that three years before would not have even been considered possible. And the pendulum swing. So there is sort of where is the money availability and the opportunity availability. There is uh, also the ownership that you must keep with the team and the in order to keep the team incentivized. I mean, in the end, the numbers always work out in a certain way, but because neither party can be too greedy. I mean, if the entrepreneur, let's say the entrepreneur had no choice except you, and you came in and said, yeah, I'll give you the money, but I want 90% of the company. Does that make sense? Exactly. I mean, okay, great. You just won, bought 90% of the company, but they're demotivated. They're not going to be able to hire A players because they can't give them enough shares, etc. So is it really a victory? So there is no answer. I mean, there are parameters. 
It depends on how senior the team is. It depends how much work was done before they came to you. I mean, again, I'm talking about institutional investors. Many companies now are funded with angel money or self-funded before, how much progress they've made. It's, again, it's a negotiation. Now, the slide I had, which is not in here, uh, but in the end it says, how do you get the best valuation for the entrepreneur? Addressing it to the entrepreneur, get as much competition as you can between VCs. I mean, that is the way to do it. It is a competitive process, and if you have VCs who really want to do the deal, they will compete with, with each other, and the entrepreneur will get the best deal. And the reverse is also true. If there isn't a lot of competition, uh, you know, within the parameters of keeping people motivated, it's going to be the VC who, 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 who dictates the valuation. Within certain parameters, again, they're not stupid to go kill the deal, but within that. But there is no formula. A lot of people ask me exactly, I mean, I don't, you know, I want to give this much percent of the company. And I say, and again, that's not the way I should, I mean, when I was an entrepreneur, that's not the way I thought about it. That's not the way I think people should think about it. It should be, what do we need to accomplish on this money? And then work out the valuation and the amounts and so on. A uh, very good question on incubators and early stage investors. So by the way, I'm not sure I agree that the number of incubators that are around today is, uh, is on the decline. I mean, there are, it's on, the rise. it's on the rise and there are lots of incubators. I mean, just driving up on one today, I saw coming off of one of the exits, I saw two buildings that sounded from the name, Startup Labs, I think, or something like that, and another one <coughs> sounded like incubators. So I'm not sure that incubators are in decline. If anything, if you'd ask me what my sense is, yes, you're right. In the late 90s, there was a huge number of incubators started. And then that went away. But over the last four or five years, starting with Y Combinators and others, it's coming back. As far as the sources of capital, it is interesting. And this is changing very fast. Last year, and I'm pretty sure I know that this is correct, more money was invested by angels and super angels and friends and family than by VCs. Okay, if you just look at the total money that was invested in startups, I think it was in the United States, but I could be wrong. It was more money came from these non-traditional VC sources than from VC sources. That pendulum, my opinion, is beginning to swing. Okay, I think there is still ample uh, seed and angel money available, but it is shrinking at this point. It's again, the pendulum is swinging the other way. Um, the uh, number, the, uh, uh, I don't know what's, how it's going to turn out this way. There's a separate problem which has been created, which is now everybody's talking about in the industry, which is a little bit different, which is since we funded so many seed and early stage companies because there was this availability of cash, how are you going to fund them in the A round and when there are just too many of them, right? And you can think about it in a way, if the whole VC industry in the US is capable of funding typically 1,000 Series A a year. I'm, again, I'm making the number up a little bit, but it's 1,000 a year. And in the past, 2,000 companies were being seeded, so half of them, the better half hopefully, are able to raise a Series A. Well, if in the last few years 10,000 were funded, and the capacity to do Series A has not expanded in the same way, well, what's going to happen? And this is a problem I think we're beginning to face right now, and a, a problem that I don't see an easy answer to. So again, the best 1,000 will probably get funded, but now you have a tail of 9,000 that are not going to get funded. And that's a big problem for the year, this year and the years to come. Uh, my question one last okay, one last question. So, I mean, I think it's a broader question of what I call the, the larger team, okay? People can be extremely valuable to entrepreneurs whether they're formally on the board or not. Whether they're on the board of directors or board of advisors or an informal relationship, all of that is very valuable. And I can, again, I mentioned we sort of ask who is the broader team. There is the core team and then there is all of the people who are going to help them with contacts, with relationships, with referrals, 
with uh, maybe even with the hiring because they work somewhere or work somewhere and know some people and so on. So I think if you think of it more broadly than just a director, a board director, then it's hugely valuable and usually it comes at a much lower cost than going to hire people to do these things. And a company can really, you know, the team can leverage and multiply the effect of what they can do by having the right advisors around them. If you think, asking specifically about board of directors members, that is much more of a fiduciary responsibility. Mm -hmm. So to me, a board member is, can be as valuable as a formal board member, as an advisor, an advisory board person. It doesn't matter. A company needs a board for fiduciary reasons. Investors want to be there to look after their company and the investment. But that's less valuable to me than the broader ecosystem of advisors and helpers and, and people that can do it, that can, can provide this kind of assistance. So short question is, you know, maybe nothing, not much as a purely as a board member, but as an active board member who's going to actually help the company with introductions, with hiring, with strategic planning, et cetera. Again, I had a slide on this which we took out. Then there is a lot of value, and usually it comes at a low cost. There's just so much talent, especially in this area. People who want to keep a finger, want to help younger people, or want to just be involved, that you can pull together a lot of firepower, so to speak, at very low cost through these kind of initiatives. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.